<laughs> you want me to talk about Stoke? <laughs> Serving California? Stoke? You bet, man. Serving California gets unreal. First time I came to California to surf was in 75. And this friend of mine said, you've never been to California to go surf? And I said, no. And so he took, brought me over to California. We stayed at a friend's house in Laguna Beach. Actually, it was Dan Fowley who has the Pavoni's land. And um, got to meet Big Dan there. And then uh, one morning, everybody was sleeping. And it was just starting to get dawn. And I put, the friend of mine had a Lopez. Hot dog board, it was unreal. And everybody was sleeping, so I took the guy's board and his wetsuit and drove down to Salt Creek. And it was perfect, there was like one guy out. And I pulled up and it was straight offshore. The sun was just coming up. It was my first look at California ways. And I looked and there was this perfect left, about three feet, four feet, and one guy out. And I just went, wow, this is California. And I went out and I had a blast. And I just went, God, this is like a secret to me. <laughs> And then my parents had been living in Ethiopia for three years, and then they had been living in Argentina for three years, and I hadn't seen them. And this is 1979. And I'd been coming over to California a lot for the contests and stuff. And um, my mom called me up on the phone and talked to her for six years. And I had just left Laguna Beach, that's where Lightning Bolt was headquartered. And I flew back to Tendry for the phone rang, it's my mom, she goes, I go, where are you? She goes, you ever heard of Laguna Beach? We just moved from Argentina to Laguna Beach. You know where that is? I couldn't believe it. I said, I just left there yesterday, Mom. So I'll see you tomorrow. So I jumped in the plane, showed up, pulled up where they lived. They lived at Miguel Shores, right above Salt Creek. <laughs> I just went, there are angels in the world, boy, I tell you. And some friends of mine took me to Black's one early morning. And it was really, it was really foggy, man. You couldn't see the sets coming, but it was really big. And uh, I remember one time, it was so foggy, you couldn't see, probably about 50 foot visibility. And everybody just sitting there, and it was just still for too long, and I could feel it in my bones, man. And I started just slowly paddling out towards the horizon. And then I could feel it when I just started stroking for the horizon. Meanwhile, these other guys are talking to each other. And next thing you know, there's this 10 foot wave, man. I'm just scrabbling up the face. Pulled to the top. Wow, man, those guys got cream, but that's how big I surfed Max. I mean, it was, I surfed another time and only one guy came up. Billy, this kid, Billy Sang, is about eight feet. Yeah, big sandbar peak, man. I just was sick for it. The tubes just had all this sand and seaweed from sucking off the bottom. <laughs> and only one guy came out, but it was awesome, man. It was a really good day. Then another good day was the Blacks with Corky Carroll, who is a character. And I got this one way. It was giant. It was one of the bigger sets. And Corky was on his longboard, and he's out of the he's out of the way, and he's just all excited flapping his arms like this. Meanwhile, I'm about 20 feet behind him, just holding my ass, man, just so far deep in the barrel, trying to avoid his wake. And he's in there doing this quirky thing. And I came out and like, he looked at me, you were behind me? I just going, yeah, and I'll never do that again. <laughs> what a character. The 
This is a garden that San Onofre Surf Club takes care of. A memorial to a lot of the guys that have been surfing there for years. And everybody pitches in and keeps this place alive. A lot of this bamboo's been growing here for years. I guess one of the guys told me yesterday that some of the bamboo washed up on shore. They started planting it about 20 years ago and it's yeah, you know true. been growing ever since. But our whole group comes over here and we all take care of this place and work together and surf all day, bring our families and have a lot of fun. And that's what living the California dream is all about. You know, so San Onofre is a good place, man. Family vibe and happy times. A lot of these guys have been here for three generations with their families and these guys have been part of the club. A lot of the guys here have known these guys throughout the years from the old timers that have been around here. And some of the guys have been famous in San Clemente working in surf shops. And one day we all hope to get our plaque here if we uh, mean something to somebody, you know. That's, that's about how we do it. <laughs> What is it? It's just uh, potatoes, bacon, and, and vegetables. No pepper. No. Hey, Scott, you got that cheese? It's right here. I'm going to sprinkle it on with double the usual amount so we can have it real cheesy if we want. A little bit more than that. <laughs> and mushrooms. At Newport Beach, I served Newport 56th Street. That's when Quicksilver, Bobby Knight, the, I did their first Quicksilver ad, and we used to hang out at his house at 54th Street. I caught this wave from 54th Street. It was, God, it gets really good there. I caught this wave, and it just kept going and going, you know. I, and I kept riding the white water, and I just wanted to see how far I could go. And I kept riding the white water. It just kept connecting, you know. It was just two feet of white water, but it just kept going parallel to the beach, you know. So I said, I just want to see how far I could ride this wave. So I kept riding it, riding it, riding it, and fighting the fins. You know, dra we're dragging in the sand. I stepped off, picked up my board and said, he's walking down the beach. I go, what block is this? He goes, 61st Street. I rode away for five blocks. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Unreal, yeah. Good times in California. San Onofre is a blast. Now, now I know why they call it old man's, because I like it. <laughs> the old man like it. But that's a real fun life. We had fun that day we were down there. It wasn't anything, you know, to write home about, but I have surfed several times. One time, a long time ago, Jackie Duck. California beach party lifestyle. People in the North Shore don't go to the beach. They go, I never go to the beach and lay on the beach. I go to the beach and paddle out. And then I come in and go home. But I mean, you don't go stay at the beach all day long on the North Shore. It's California, man, it's a party. It's a, it's a lifestyle. You go to the beach, take your cooler. Stuff. I've never taken a cooler to the beach. I've never even taken a towel to the beach. <laughs> you know, I'm lucky if I have wax and a fins crew <laughs> and a leash. But, uh, but the, the California surf culture is really, you know, it's a really big Ohana kind of thing where everybody hangs out. Whereas the North Shore is more, everybody's in their own little separate group of guys, you know. There's, there's Jamie O'Brien and his group and John Dunn and then there's, you know, the other guys over here, TJ Barron and 
Bill Long or not, you know, it's, it's a much different scene. But over here, it's more of the beach life. My dad, the colonel, asked me a long time ago, well, Roy, what do you want to do with your life? I said, I just want to reach out and touch a person's heart and bring a smile to their face and leave an indelible mark. And the colonel, he looks like, well, that sounds good, but if, you know, if you can make money doing it, okay. But the money thing wasn't important to me, you know. I just wanted to go out and just bring a smile to somebody's face, get a little laugh. And so the bottom line is the surfing, teaching people how to surf is like the greatest gift that God has given me that, you know, I can't just not do it. The look on a person's face after they've ridden their first wave is indescribable. I mean, I've had people literally speechless where I thought, are, are you okay? What's wrong? I, I, I can't talk, talk. <laughs> Why? I don't know. It was too heavy. It was too exciting, you know, and it's just like, wow, that, you know, that was a major effect on this person's lives. Roses are red, violets are blue. Rory made me stand up and saved my life too. <laughs> or I've been alive for 47 years and never knew why. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, these are heart opening, mind expanding experiences. I've had guys 75 years old go out one day. I took his daughter out surfing and I asked him what he did for a living. He goes, I retired and I went, how old are you? And he goes, today's my 75th birthday. And I, I looked down at the surfboard and I go, and there's your present. Follow me. And the guy went out with his long pants on. He had a, his wife made him wear his booties over his socks because his socks stunk too bad. So he had his long pants on, rash guard, booties, 75 years old, stood up in his first wave, rode it to the beach, crowd went crazy. I went, and I was in heaven. Then he fell off his board and almost drowned because his pants were too heavy. <laughs> I didn't go into the shaping thing as to make money. It wasn't a money making, it wasn't for a job. It was for my, for my personal insight into the surfing world, you know, and my surfing abilities. The best boards you ever ride are the ones that you make yourself with your own hands because you know what you want and you know what you need. It takes time to develop the ability to make what you want. But once you have that ability, you can fine tune it so that it becomes an extension of yourself. What we're doing is we're making uh, measurements for the outside template and there's three marks we make. So you want to have three marks, you want to have a nose, 12 inches from the nose, a middle point, and 12 inches from the tail. Okay, now our total length is 76 inches. Okay, that's our middle point. So you mark your three points, 12 inches, 12 inches from the nose, your middle point, and your tail, 12 inches from your tail. So what we're doing is we're, we're putting in the width of the nose where the template's gonna go. So basically we're gonna put a 13 inch nose on a board that is six foot. And they have all the marks calibrated right here. Okay, now we're gonna do the middle or the wide point of the board. Now I'm gonna make that just a little under 20. Our second wide point and then our last third point is our tail right here. Now you take your different templates and see how they're gonna fit. 
even though it just looks like a lifeless piece of foam, boards have feelings, man. They have their own personality, each one of them. Depends on how much you put into it, how much heart you put into it. It has a lot to do with how it rides and how it performs. You gotta get a lot of love. Blood, sweat, tears. We've got a really thick tail where the deck actually turns up like a screw. I like just a flat release off the deck. Straight flat back, so that's why I'm taking this back off. Okay. It's for that perfect hot dog board and weighs from like two feet to six feet, you know? So like I said, this is one that I'm experimenting with and I'm trying to find the perfect thing. But this is the bike liner model that I've made that I've been developing for over 45 years or something since I started surfing the bike line. As you can see, they're a much longer surfboard. They have a different kind of tail in the back for a longer, more hollow wave. And these are my babies. And I don't have to experiment with these because I know they work. I have proved that they work. And so what I'm going to do is finish these off real quick. And just kind of as you can see, I've already done the rail bands. I've done the rails to the bottom. So the next step I want to do is just make sure everything's straight. Now these are my babies. I was making special edition pipe liners where I did the shaping and I had somebody else do the glassing for me. But I really wanted to make my, my statement and my impression on the surfing world. And um, there's not many pipeline masters that make a whole board, shape it, plus glass it. And glassing is not easy. But I wanted to make a definitive, definitive mark on the surfing establishment that I was capable of doing something like this. In fact, I don't think anybody will surpass my record of either first or second for five years in a row at the pipe. I don't think Kelly will do that, even though he has one more contest. But the only reason I mention that is to let you know about the history behind these boards and the lightning bolt experience and the whole pipeline. The unveiling. And there it is. And the ones that I have other people make are special edition pipeliners. But these are limited edition pipeliners and I signed all this in 18 karat gold. Now not only are you not going to find a pipeline champion that shapes a pipe liner surfboard. You're not gonna find one that shapes and glasses one. And you're definitely not gonna find one that makes his own fin. <laughs> but as you can see, this is a, these are all the limited editions are all numbered. This is number 12, completely handcrafted with Aloha by Rory Russell. This is another variation of my limited edition pipe liner with the red bowl. Absolutely gorgeous. A lot of work, made your own fin and everything. So that's my statement to the surfing world. 
<laughs> Pretty classic, huh? I can't believe it myself. I can't say any one person had any influence on how I served because you can't serve like somebody else. You can only serve like God made your body to serve, you know, the way it moves. So each person has their own individual serving style. So I knew early that I couldn't be like anybody else or I didn't want to copy anybody else. But as far as their attitude towards the waves, Jock Sutherland and Jerry would have been the biggest influences because of the way they served everything. There were, Jock, especially Jock, that's where I got to switch in from. There were no limitations on the North Shore. We didn't, there was no restrictions as to where we served. We served the best place, whether it was two feet or 20 feet. You know, if pipe was good and sunset was good, we'd serve pipe. You know, if sunset was better, we'd serve sunset instead of semi-okay pipe. But wherever, the crowd was never a factor. The biggest thing was finding people to battle out with you back then, you know, especially when it was big. I don't know if, you know, how far people want to believe in believing in God or whatever you want to call it. But it's a power much more than, than is in me. I mean, there's times when the hand, it's not my hand that does the push, the magic push, it's another hand that, that pushes that person into a brand new experience in life that they've never done before. And it blows their mind, you can only do it once. It's something they'll always remember. I was serving at Trestles one time, and uh, I had the silver wicks. Trestles was really big, it was about eight feet, 10 feet. It was really, the current was insane trying to paddle back out. And I, was, I paddled past this guy. I had this really neat wetsuit that Victory Wetsuits in Japan made me this silver with red stripes running down the arms and the legs. And I'm paddling past this guy, and he looks at me and he goes, all you need now is a rear view mirror. <laughs> I thought that was really clever. I couldn't believe my mom the first time I used the word stoked. She was like, what? And my dad, the colonel, was like, yeah, man, I was so stoked. And they were just like, you were stoked about what? I was happy, man. I, oh, okay, okay. I mean, it was just like, it was like the word bitching. Bitching and stoked go hand in hand. You know, they both started about the same time. I was so bitching, I'm so stoked. How many times have you said that? That was so bitch, I'm so stoked.